Sorry about that. And I was uh, thanking Merrick and Liz for the invitation to, to be with you all and, to share, and for sharing the pulpit with me this morning. Crystal Sal, uh, we're a human rights organization that was founded by the Anglican Bishop of El Salvador. Uh, and has and our history, our support, our programs uh, have, have been supported through the Episcopal Church in the United States for the 13 years that we've been in existence. Uh, so it's always a privilege to be able to come back and share uh, with people in the church how your support is having an impact uh, in El Salvador. And now, uh, as of about two months ago, in Guatemala and Honduras as well, we're the first human rights organization in Central America to have a presence in all three of those countries uh, in the region that we call the Northern Triangle of Central America. I, I wanted to start obviously talking a little about the gospel. It's not my area of expertise, uh, but this particular reading I think is a good entry point to talk about the human rights field, human rights work, uh, specifically this imagery of the vine. Uh, Jesus said that I am the vine and you are the branches. Uh, and when I was thinking of this gospel reading, uh, the imagery of the vine, I was thinking of actual vineyards. And those of you who have seen uh, grape plants, they grow in, as these little knots that interconnect and intertwine and they grow out. And it reminded me, and struck me that this imagery is something that's reflected. It's almost like a universal imagery. Uh, in different religions across the world, we see, it, we see these knots, these interconnected loops in Celtic crosses, the Mayan calendar, uh, the, the mosaics in the Blue Mosque. It's something, a, a human question about what it means to be human beings, what it means to live together, what it means to be connected. How are we connected? What's between us? It's a deep spiritual question uh, that Jesus seems to be answering today by saying that I am the vine, you are the branches. That is that we are together as a human people, humankind, an interconnected knot. And at the center of the knot is God. Uh, and that, that's a message I think uh, that's powerful because especially in a time uh, where we increasingly feel isolated, uh, both as people, as communities and countries, we're reminded by the vine imagery that we are not. For as much as we'd like to pretend that we are, we're all interconnected. We're shared people. God and his people in one messy, interconnected plant. This image, I think, is also, uh, it poses that question about uh, if we are all connected, what are our responsibilities? It's a, it, it evokes that Old Testament question, am I my brother's keeper? It's, to say, it's, a, it's a human rights question, actually. It's the issue of if we are all connected, uh, what are our responsibilities to those who are different from ourselves? What responsibilities do we have to those who suffer? And in these kind of biblical and human rights questions, uh, we have to come to a conclusion uh, that's told to us more bluntly in the reading from John today. It says that all of those who say that I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. It's this sort of a impossibility then in the gospel to deny the truth that we're part of an interconnected knot and that we have a responsibility to each other and we have special responsibilities, I would say, to those who suffer. This is an interesting question too when we consider El Salvador, when we consider Central America. The United States and that region are interconnected both in people and in history. Uh, during the Salvadoran Civil War, the United States was deeply involved uh, in the conflict. That's the atrocities that were committed during that, that period of, uh, of terrible fighting in Central America was what ignited a diaspora of Salvadorans to the United States. Today there are six and a half million Salvadorans in El Salvador and two million in the United States. This diaspora continues today as violence in El Salvador continues to drive outflows of people. And recently in our national conversations, specifically, the president has wondered out loud, what responsibilities do we have to Salvadorans? He's mentioned Salvadorans on, the Long, I on Long Island. Uh, he's talked about Salvadoran gangs as evidence that we should be afraid of others. 
We even have a caravan of Central Americas who have arrived at Tijuana. Uh, and in fear of them, we've sent the National Guard. As a side note, I should mention that I know one of the families in the caravan and their f- family from an Episcopal church in the town of San Martin. A family of people who are fleeing threats uh, and violence perpetrated by the gangs that control the area that they live in. It's to say that as much as we wonder why people would want to leave their countries or why they come to our country, uh, we also have to remember that the conditions in other countries in the world are not isolated from our own lives or from the interests and policies of our own countries. And El Salvador, I think, is an interesting case example. One of the issues that Crystal Sal has specialized on in recent years is the issue of assisting these victims of violence. El Salvador, from 2004 to 2010, per capita was more violent than Iraq at the peak of the Iraq War. In 2015, there were 7,000 Salvadorans murdered. In 2016, 6,000 Salvadorans. In 2017, 4,000. Those are numbers of violent deaths that compare to any armed conflict in the world, yet we've been slow to recognize our responsibility to protect people fleeing one of the most violent countries in the world. And this is the primary issue that Crystal Saw has been advocating on. When we ask why do people flee, it's because when they suffer threats of violence or acts of violence in El Salvador, the most violent country in the world, there is no protection program. Victims don't find safety and security fleeing their homes. Victims aren't offered assistance by the government. They don't have access to justice to repair the damage done to them as a by criminal gangs, and sometimes the state itself. So Crystal Sala specialized in assisting victims of internal displacement by violence. We've created a program where we can offer safe house protection for families in emergencies. We provide humanitarian, psychological, and legal assistance to those people so they can begin to rebuild their lives, and hopefully they may not be forced to flee their country. Our bigger vision is that one day there will be a human... A, a, Uh, a protection system in El Salvador, and ultimately peace, so Salvadorans won't be forced to flee their country. But today that's still not the case. When we began to work on this issue, it was because Salvadorans actually began to knock on our door. In about 2010 and 2011, uh, they began to come to our office and say, we can't go home. Gangs have told us that if we go home, we'll all be slaughtered. They've demanded us uh, to hand them our daughters for sexual exploitation. They've made any series of demands on us, and we can't go home tonight. And that felt to us like an obligation. It gave us a mandate to begin to work on an issue that at that time nobody was talking about. And when we first brought the issue forward, it made the Salvadoran government very uncomfortable. The idea that we had evidence that they were unable to protect people for the Salvadoran government was an indicator that they might say that they're failing in their primary responsibility to protect the citizens. So instead of being cooperative with us over the last five years, the Salvadoran government has intimidated us. They've tried to delegitimize what we say. But this last week, we had a change. This last week, uh, and I'm gloating a little bit because it's a big change. We were planning that we were going to present our annual report on forced displacement by violence. Last year, Crystal Sal assisted 701 individuals forced to flee their homes. We were able to provide life-saving assistance to over 700 people in 2017. But we also were able to create a database, an evidence base, uh, documentational evidence that makes it irrefutable. You can no longer deny that displacement exists. And we, did a com- we developed a media campaign over the last two weeks in which our staff have been on the television, we've been on the radio, we've been in the print media, social media, and on Thursday we, were gonna, we presented our official report. A week before the, the event on Thursday, we gave the Minister of Justice a copy of the report. And we said, we know that you don't think that this exists, you know, we know that you don't think this is a problem, but read our report and then let's talk about it. And we invited him to a televised forum on Thursday. At the forum, the Minister of Justice and Security said that he read Crystal Sal's report and that the Ministry of Justice and Security agrees with every aspect of the report. The forced displacement by violence is a grave problem in El Salvador that the government has failed in their leadership to protect people 
and they need to change. And even more so, he said, that probably Crystal Cell has protected more victims in the last year than the government itself. That's precisely the issue we're trying to change. It's, it's not the Crystal Cell's responsibility to protect victims. It is the government's. And we're trying to build capacity in the government and responsibility to assume that role. In doing this, we find that our best allies are the victims themselves. The victims of violence in El Salvador are often invisible. They hide. Because there is no national protection system, the responsibility to protect themselves falls on the families themselves. So they often go in clandestinity and, and, inter and displace internally in the country, hiding in houses, until that's no longer viable and they're forced to cross an international border. The victims of, inter of, of displacement in El Salvador are invisible, so our job has been to make them visible. We made them visible in the report, but we've also been able to help to be able to, for, to accompany the victims in accessing justice. One family in particular was emblematic of this, a family of 24 people in the town of Villapango in El Salvador, next to San Martin. And the family ran a shop, a store, uh, in, in an area controlled by the Mara Salvatrucha, the gang called the Mara Salvatrucha, the same one that the president mentions is, exists here in the United States. Came to the family and they said, we want your store and we're going to give you 24 hours to leave the house or we'll kill all of you. The family left with the exception of the father who stayed in the home to protect the family's belongings. The family uh, was referred to us because they were still suffering threats even after having displaced uh, and we offered them safe house protection. They denied it. They said that we don't want to. I want my, the mother said that I want my children to get back into school. We can't live in a safe house. Sadly, three weeks later, the father was disappeared. And when the father was disappeared, the family accepted to enter into our program. And part of our program, our lawyers provided legal assistance not only to begin to uh, prepare the family for the next step, step, but also to access justice and search for the body of the missing father. Three months later, we found it in a mass grave with seven other bodies. When we found the father, we, uh, we, we came to a reflection with the family that in a grave of seven, behind each one of those individuals, potentially there are 20 family members who were forced to abandon their lives, who lost everything, but remained invisible. And so we began to talk to the family but the way that that's emblematic of something that's happening to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Salvadorans every year. And we said, would you be interested in bringing your case before the Supreme Court? And the family reflected, and it didn't take long at all, and actually it was the kids who were most emphatic, or em emphatic about it. And they said, we know how much that we have suffered. We know that we haven't received assistance. There's been no options for us. And if us bringing our case forward means that one family doesn't have to suffer what we have to. It's worth the risk that we would run in bringing our case forward. And so they did it. They brought their case to the Supreme Court, and we were able to do this with six other families last year. And of those six cases in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has decided to rule on four. And in the Supreme Court's first ruling is they, gave, they, they ruled in favor of the families. They said that effectively the Salvadoran government and not protecting people internally displaced by violence are violating their constitutional rights. And in a final ruling that we expect in two weeks, the Supreme Court will obligate the executive and the legislator to change the legal framework to create protect, special programs to protect victims in El Salvador and a budget allocation to make sure that those programs have the resources to uh, assist families in the most serious of conditions. I mention this because it's one of the most gratifying parts of our work is that we're able to provide life-saving assistance to individuals, but in doing so, in bringing cases forward and trying to active, access justice, we're able to have a systemic impact. Our work and our accompaniment with the victims over the last five years has effectively changed national policy. We've changed the position of the government. We've changed the position of the people. Our, our event on Thursday was attended by 40 media outlets 
Crystal Sala and our report was covered uh, almost entirely in all of the print media and televised media in El Salvador. The people have decided that protecting individuals needs to be a priority in the country's security strategy. We were able to save lives, but we were also to make able to make structural change. It's been a long time coming, but it, and the, you can see that I'm gloating, I'm happy. It's been a long, hard time coming. And we know that the, the recognition by the minister on Thursday isn't the end of the game. The Supreme Court decision will also force a recognition to translate into actual substantive programming, but we also have to continue to advocate. I wanted to share these stories because I think when we read the newspapers about the dark places in the world, like El Salvador, uh, from the standpoint of the United States, the world seems to be intractable. This knot, this interconnected vine that we are, uh, humanity seems to be in this strange point in which nothing can be done. That change has been, is, is delayed, it's stalled, it's not possible. But I feel like we have to look at the, the, the courage of the people who suffer most in this interconnected vine of humanity. And if the victims who suffer violence, the victims who suffer persecution, have the courage and have the hope to try and work for change, those of us who go home at night to safety and security don't have the privilege to be resigned to not work for change and justice in the world. We have an obligation to walk with the people who suffer. We have a special obligation to each other, especially those different from ourselves, and especially those who suffer. I wanted to close with the words of our patron saint, Oscar Romero. He was the bishop of El Salvador, who, while celebrating Mass in 1980, was assassinated by a sharpshooter. His death was what sparked the Salvadoran Civil War. Being too political for talking about justice in the church, I remind the people that there are two projects on earth. There are the projects of men that are characterized by greed and ambition, and then there is the eternal project of heaven that's characterized by justice, peace, and love. It's the Christian mission to reflect the light of the project of heaven in the historic projects of men. I want to share this because it's the spirit that drives Crystal South's mission, and it's the spirit that we hope you all can join us and walk with us in continuing to walk with the victims of the violence in the region closest to the United States. So remember that those people, when they flee, their refugee camps aren't far away, they're in your own homes and communities. I'm asking you all to remember that Salvadorans aren't your enemies, they aren't a threat to you. Most of them here are here fleeing terrible acts of violence and look at your country and your home as places of safety and security. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.